not that many years ago, I realized, wow, I, I smile a lot. I'm happy. My identity has been one of a teacher, you know, with, and, and that's applicable in every part of my life. My mom called me Calamity Jane, and my dad referred to me as Maria in The Sound of Music. I was, I was always a curi very curious person, and that's what drove me to study the sciences. I did graduate from US, well, I call it SJC, but USJ in 1973. I'm Marie Benoit Connors. My name is Dane Lasky. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Pharmacy, and my specialty is clinical toxicology. Hi, I am Paula De Silva, class of, yay, 1968, and I graduated with a degree in child study and special ed. From the time I was in fifth grade, I had this little, little light in my brain that said, wouldn't you like to be a medical missionary? But that was like this awesome, what is that? And Nedra opened that door, and that happened here at St. Joseph. I took the red pill, I like to say, uh, did a residency and a fellowship in toxicology. Um, and then looking for jobs uh, afterwards, I found St. Joe's, who um, had a, just was a great fit for the things that I wanted to do in my career and, uh, and found myself here. I was asked to, do, to come to a Solathon at uh, St. Anne's Church in Avon. I helped set up that particular day and the coordinator at the end of the day said, you look like you're really organized. And I said, I try to be. She said, would you mind taking this over because I'm moving to Virginia next week? I think we're put on this earth to do something and leave the earth a better place. And I've always thought that. And it just kind of was an opportunity and I kind of didn't know how to say no. Back in our day, this was my era, the Disney Wonderful World of Disney was a uh, big do on, on the weekend, Sunday night. And there was a program that they presented about teachers of, of blind and deaf kids, and it was just, it captured my attention. I thought this was like, wow, this is amazing. It was a sister of mercy that it came to my parish and talked about working with the women in, in Niantic in a Christian women's prison ministry. And I thought, oh, corporate worker mercy, haven't done that, never wanted to do that. But if sister says it's okay, well, maybe Sister Betty Secord. All right, maybe I'll give it a try. That was about 13, 14 years ago. I'm still doing it. The, the great fit here at St. Joe's was because they offered so much freedom and flexibility for me to practice the way that I am trained to practice and bring those skills and, and those experiences into the classroom for the students. They were open to unique ideas about teaching and teaching styles and, and they embraced creativity. Uh, so the pharmacy school was a great, a great place for me to begin my, my professional career. One of the things they really all children like is to be in the water in the summertime, but they didn't know how to swim. And I came here to St. Joseph and asked if I could bring some of the refugee students. And the swimming coach was so open and so wonderful and said, you know, oh yes, we would be happy to do that. And how they made that happen on this end. I took many lessons, <laughs> many lessons. And I like being in the water, but I'm much better if I have a little float with me. St. Joe's was so open, welcoming, and for the children, how important it was, and it is for them, now they know how to swim. So I went in with what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a special educator. I came out with that degree, and you know, elementary and special ed. I did my student teaching in Vernon, Connecticut. At that time, it was kind of a day program for some of the, the regional kids that were a little more severe and profound, um, had more severe and profound problems. So that was, a, that was kind of a unique experience. Uh, Talcottville School was the name of the, the little school in, in this little area in Vernon. And then I graduated, I got married, and that was my first job, Vernon, Connecticut. I felt like, you know, I, I'm supposed to do this, I'm called to do this, I know I, I can do this, and, uh, and there we go, we're off and running. About 
20 years ago, our one of our daughters, Namali, was getting married, and I was trying to decide what to give her. And I saw a magazine that said quilt in a day. And I thought, oh, I could do that. Well, a year later, I finished her quilt with fabric that I recruited from her aunts and uncles and cousins in Sri Lanka and in Canada and Kentucky where she went to school and incorporated all that fabric into her quilt. And that started me on the path of quilting. The quilting that involved other people started the night after Sandy Hook. I thought I'm going to make a quilt for each of those 26 families, the 20 children and the six educators. So I put a word out to my Haiti volunteer sewers and within three days it had, by a very circuitous route, wound up on the Channel 3 morning news. The garden was founded in 2014 and when we started this area behind me used to be a parking lot. We had to hack through asphalt and gravel to to create a bed here capable of growing plants. We trucked in soil, built the, built the walls around it, and started with 12 plants, 12 uh, humble species that we were able to show. Since then, we've expanded and now have 40 plants. The overall purpose of the garden is to kind of bridge this gap in that a lot of people have this idea that uh, on one hand you have pharmaceutical drugs, on the other hand you have natural remedies, and that these are two separate things that are incompatible with one another. But in fact, two-thirds of our modern medicines that we use in Western medicine today at least have their roots in nature. And the purpose of the garden is to show the roots or the origins of many of our modern medications that you can find in your medicine cabinet. One of my professors, Nedra Kokomo in nursing, she said she was going to Haiti. She had been the year before and she wanted to go back, run a little medical mission. And I've always had an interest. You do your little part. You know, and everybody does their little part. And one of the Episcopal sisters said to me, as I was leaving, it seems so little what we do. And she said, did you ever see how many ripples one pebble makes in a bucket of water? That was 1983, and I'm still going. When I was there in June, I was introduced to 221 orphans in one classroom. As a result of going to this area, I now, three and a half years ago, started my own 501c nonprofit called Helping Haitian Children. They have a school there, Our Lady of Fatima School, that has over 700 students. There was, there was no meal provided because of the expense, and the principal said many children come to school, haven't, had, they haven't eaten that day because very often they eat only every other day and they fall asleep and they're listless and they don't learn. So I thought, you know, my nursing piece, where can I fit? Because the group I go with, there's the medical team, there's the building team, they need an eating team or a feeding team. So I decided that I would try to start there. So the money has been raised and we are sending enough that they can provide a lunch program now four days a week over 700 students. I think I was 58 when I was got this invitation to Moldova. It was basically one of these things where a guy stood up at church who wanted to lead this group and said, um, we're looking for people to go to Moldova to uh, teach them English and share the gospel. We partner with other pastors and local pastors and local churches in Moldova. So they bring the kids and we bring the teachers and the, and the kind of the, the program, so to speak. I'll tell you what, it was like, I don't know, a day and a half, and I knew it was like, I love this place. I love these people, I love this place. This is like nothing I'd ever experienced. This is what this feels like, to be like smack in the center, you know, right in the center of where God's calling and purposes and, and what he's laid into my life all these years and built into me and his calling for me is like, this is like the sweet spot. And it was like, I, before I left, I knew I was going back. <laughs> you know, so it was like, okay, we're good. We're good, we're gonna do this. I'm somebody who dives headfirst into everything I do. This garden has been particularly special for me uh, in that it's allowed me to, uh, to interact with people that I otherwise would not have ever spoken with. I find a lot of people come down to the garden because 
they're looking to learn something, they're looking to reaffirm something they already believe is true, and it can be fun sometimes to, to either shake that up or to learn new things myself, which is happening all the time down here. So for me, studying the power of plants, the power of, of how substances affect the human body, and particularly when things go wrong, how to correct that course, that's where my passion lies. I got a job at the Department of Mental Retardation and um, I was in charge of 14 towns for children who were excluded. The program was really based mostly on school-age kids, 5 to 18, who were non-ambulatory and non-verbal. But there were a lot of children who were being born with um, Down syndrome, both in East Hartford and in Enfield. For what reason, I don't know and they were excluded from public education. And I started the first uh, children's infant stimulation program. Faith is a soft place to land when the world isn't kind to you. So you have to find some place inside of yourself with someone else, with our Creator, that helps you know that you are more than who you are. You're, you're part of society, part of life, part of the world. and need to know that you're important in that part of the world. In 1988, I was adopting two children. I met a, another woman from USJ there, adopting three children, adopting triplets. And it was the neatest thing, that comfort, the both of us. And we both knew Sister Laura Harold, and we met in Lima, Peru, adopting our families. Yeah, that was another USJ connection. So when I met her and Sister Laura, I had heard that Sister Laura had started a home for men with AIDS in Hartford. When I got home, I immediately called her and I became her nurse for several years at that group home for men with AIDS. The beauty of the pharmacy school is they gave me a scaffold of, of what they needed, uh, what we needed to accomplish, and then the way by which we get to those goals was left up to me. If you go to the school, you'll find a lot of creative methods, you'll find um, things that you don't see in other pharmacy schools. We spend about 50% of our classroom time doing active learning activities with the students, doing things that I didn't have the opportunity to do in my training. So it, it was really kind of a, a unique place to get a start. All of this has been building for, for such a time as this, you know. There's like the melding of my, of my teaching and my desire and my passion for, you know, developing kids and bringing them to a new and a more, and then, you know, also helping them to see that there's more inside. There's more in their hearts and spirits and minds. I think that's, you know, that, that's been the progression. One of my favorite books is A Little Engine That Could. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. So even though life is sometimes challenging, just push yourself and you probably will get to the point saying, ah, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. When doors open now, with my, especially with my Haiti involvement, I no longer walk through, I run through. I'm too old to walk, I gotta get these experiences going and keep them. I have so much to be grateful for and so much to be thankful to for the, the involvement, my involvement, with the University of St. Joseph. I was really fortunate. I, was, I think I was really fortunate in the sense that I knew who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. I could kind of like go after that. St. Joe's just ended up making sense on so many levels. And I think it was, you know, it was the place I was supposed to be.